turning the neon light off this week because I realized there was a pillar of glare these last couple weeks right here and I couldn't for the life of me edit it out so a little astronaut man's just gonna have to go dark for a couple weeks. Um, I kind of let it go because the only thing I have is these string lights which although create a fantastic ambiance isn't enough lighting to denoise the footage for you camera nerds out there. Uh, but my regular light fixture, which I usually have on at the same time to give me just more, um, not natural light, but natural to the room, it quite literally exploded. So that's that. Anyways, that's not what we're talking about this week. This week we are talking about something that I am terrible at, but very enamored with, which is guitar solos. And kind of when this became a staple to music, like, you think of music back then and there really wasn't a designated section of a song for one type of instrument, not just a guitar, any of the instruments to have their shining moment. It was kind of everybody all together every time. So when did this, it's, we're focusing on guitar this week, when did this kind of become almost like an expectation out of some genres. And something that occurred to me while I was kind of researching this stuff is that there's also a lot of, there's always going to be debate about whether or not rock and roll is dead or rumors that it is and that the guitar is dying, guitar solos are dying. Uh, so I kind of took a detour and looked at when guitar solos started to fall off uh, versus when they're starting to pick back up again and where they are, or if they're even really falling off to begin with, or if the eye of the mainstream has just stopped looking at them. Because I want to be very clear, just because pop media isn't looking at something doesn't mean that it's dying, it just means everybody else stopped paying attention. So you know, to say that rock or the guitar solo is dead is quite foolish. It always has been and it always will be, because there's going to be a large fraction of music fans who this is their everyday. This is what we're listening to. This is what we're learning. This is what we're doing. Just because you are not in the party doesn't mean we died. Which means we're not friends anymore. So there's some debate about who recorded the first guitar solo, of course, because, you know, no one's going to take anything for granted. There has to be physical proof, and even then there's going to be people who hear that physical proof and don't believe it. Uh, but Charlie Christian is usually referred to as one of the first truly influential electric guitarists, with his heyday being in the 20s and 30s. Not only in a band setting, you know, as a rhythm guitarist, as a writer, he was regarded very highly, but he also kind of pioneered the idea of just him going off on his own and everybody kind of steps back, lets him to the forefront, and then jumps back in following his creative detour. And most of these are going to be from the 30s, that 20s and 30s. That's where kind of the debate comes in because it's like, well, was it 1932, three, four, five? It's like all right there. It seemed like it wasn't just one person having this idea and showing it off. It was multiple people kind of at the same time. It was just who was recorded first. Yeah, that's why this gets kind of sketchy. So another option is Eddie Durham playing on Hitting the Bottle, recorded September 30th, 1935. This was supposedly a year after uh, Charlie Christian's first recorded solo. Uh, supposedly, again, the date could be incorrect, my research could be incorrect, they could have been the same year, Eddie could have been first, who knows. But September 30th, 1935 uh, consistently popped up, so I would consider that one a hard date. It's Charlie that's up for debate. And then there's George Brewer with A Good Man It's Hard to Find in 1932. Um, but the recording is really, really poor. Uh, there's a lot of background noise that makes it really hard to tell what's even happening or being played. If he's playing alone, if he's even soloing, if it was a different member of the band. So that one is not really regarded as the first because, again, the, the, even though there's physical evidence, it's so poorly constructed you can't even tell what's happening. Uh, it, 
it would be a very loose definition of hard evidence of a guitar solo. It's like when you're looking at a picture of Bigfoot, it just looks like a smudge in the middle of the, of the photo. It's kind of like that, but as a recording. We have another 1935, which is Texas Playboys, which we actually have video proof of, but we don't have a month or a date. It could literally be September 29th. So first, second, same time, who knows. So there's no solid proof of the first solo, uh, you know, the kickoff to this trend. Uh, but we know someone somewhere played a sets of notes over a melody and those notes acted like a vocal line would, but on guitar, because that's all the solo is. It's, it's the solo doing the vocalist job for so many seconds or minutes. Somebody did that somewhere for the first time, whatever. And for some reason, we started pushing ourselves to get faster, uh, to bend higher. Essentially, the goal became to melt faces, pull heartstrings, more than the last person until all of a sudden we didn't. And it's really a weird evolution when you think about it because it kind of almost goes backwards. Uh, I'm going to put a disclaimer at the head of this before I start rambling any further. Um, this isn't roasting any type of music. I like most kinds of music and even the kinds that I don't like, I don't hate them. They're just not for me. So this isn't a roast by any means. This is just simply stating these later years don't, they just don't have as many guitar solos. They just don't play them. When you really look at music as a whole, across all of the music being made, all of the musics, it's you are less likely to see long or lengthy, note riddled, tap, bend, whammy dive littered solos. They've kind of gone by the wayside when you're looking at percentage of music that has it versus doesn't. Um, they're not dead, they're just not mainstream anymore. And why? Why has it evolved into the discard bin or like the misfits bin? Not that us rock and metal people don't like being misfits, but you know, what happened to guitarists like Eddie Van Halen-esque, Carlos Santana-esque, you know, these historical figures? What happened to those guys being on mainstream radio all the time? What, what happened to them being on the covers of magazines. And it's weird that I actually found kind of an answer for this. I kind of thought this was going to be an opinionated riddled thing because music, despite being a communal activity, musicking being a communal activity, uh, it brings a lot of war for some reason. I think it's because there's humans involved and for as much as we say we hate war, we kind of act like we love it. But uh, it boils down to the psychological effects of lyrics versus notes. People, people who make music and are very familiar with more of the intricacies of it, who aren't, they're a little more than just like a fan or a listener, they actually make music, they understand music, are more likely to remember a solo and how it made us feel than someone who's just casually listening to the radio or just has randomized playlists. And it's not a bad thing, again, there's nothing wrong with just not really being that interested in the intricacies of it. And I think that portion of it stems from musicians knowing how much work it took to make that. So we are just a little more inclined to appreciate it differently, not necessarily more, but differently than someone who doesn't isn't as familiar with how much work that took to get that solo or that instrumental to where it was. The stronger the connection, the more likely people are to listen to it and listen to it again. Because human beings like to feel. Even if the song makes you feel sad, you're gonna listen to it again. The song can make you bawl your eyes out and you're gonna listen to it again. The song can make you rage and anger and you're gonna listen to it again because human beings like to feel things. We're cre Even people who say I'm not a feely person, they're you're a fucking liar because you're a human being and human beings like to feel things. We like to remember things. Um, 
and music with lyrics does that more than a series of notes. So that's really the answer, is that solos aren't dead by any means, but you only have so much time on the radio for your song to play. They're only going to promote songs of a certain length on online playlists. So what are you going to spend that time doing? The acceptable length is four minutes or less. It, well, more like two and a half to four minutes is really what radio stations like to see. And even though that time limit in itself comes from outdated restrictions that aren't restrictions anymore, it is the norm. And it's kind of guided how online playlists work as well, what they're going to promote. So you only really have two and a half to four-ish minutes. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to appeal to people who connect with notes? Or are you going to connect with as many people as possible using lyrics? Well, you're going to pick lyrics. But I keep going back and saying the solo isn't dead. And it's because even though what's online and what's on the radio is steering in the direction of no solos, go to a live show once of even not necessarily a pop band, but like a band that really isn't known for shredding on the radio. You go to one of their shows and if any single one of them has a guitar or if anybody's behind a drum kit with a drum solo or a bassist gets their moment in the spotlight, they will find a way to allow these people to solo. And that's really what's keeping it alive. So even though we have these online and radio restrictions that are guiding this a certain way, making it look dead, the live performance is what keeps it alive. Because people, for how much money we barf up for tickets, with two-thirds of it going to Ticketmaster, we want an experience. And that experience means I want each song to last longer than the two and a half to four minutes. If I wanted it to be the exact length that it was on the radio or on the CD that I bought, I wouldn't have fucking paid $150 for the ticket, bro. For the nosebleeds. So it's about creating this experience and that's really what's keeping it alive. Because we're, we're getting the eight to ten minute in, in some cases even 20 minute versions of a song because we're living for that experience and that tribal mentality when we go to these live performances. So it's just like vinyl where it's not necessarily better or worse it's just coming back because it's an experience. The guitar solo is coming back and going strong in a live setting because it's about the experience. I don't know if we're going to hear them on the radio anymore. We never even really did, but I think it's going to live and breathe on in the live setting for that reason. People are looking for experiences and they want to have them together even if it's with tens of thousands of strangers who they've never met before and will never see again. It doesn't matter. It's all about the experience and that's where the guitar solo is going.